Facebook, among others, has disrupted ordinary life as we know it, life in the office, personal life, life on our cell phones, and it's connected us with hundreds of people that we know personally uh, from school and our neighbors and our friends and ordinary life, and with hundreds, perhaps even thousands more people that we don't know personally, but who we may share common interests with, or who may thumbs up our post or like or watch something that we do. And it's just already radically changed things in many respects. But that's just the very beginning, because the idea of a social network is about to take on a profoundly radical change that could just, that could make everything else we've seen on the internet so far seem meaningless. And this new era is just beginning, it's just taking off, and the potential for this radical change is just immediately evident if you let sink in what's going on. And these changes are just taking hold. For the first time, researchers at Cornell University have linked up the brains of multiple people using brain-to-brain -brain interfaces so they can collaborate and work on specific problems. In the case of this study, the problem was to win at the game of Tetris. And so they linked up three people, and they're calling this system BrainNet. These researchers say, we present BrainNet, which to our knowledge is the first multi-person, non-invasive, direct brain-to-brain -brain interface for collaborative problem solving. The interface combines electroencephalography, that's EEG, to record brain signals and transcranial magnetic stimulation to deliver information non-invasively to the brain. Now that part they've been able to do for many years, but they're starting to really use it in a targeted way. They write, the interface allows three human subjects to collaborate and solve a task using direct brain-to-brain -brain communication. Two of the three subjects are senders whose brain signals are decoded using real-time EEG data analysis. Now if you've seen the film The Minds of Men, that's one of the most important points that emerged out of the study of cybernetics and out of the study of the brain and the attempt to modify it. The ability to use real-time EEG data analysis to read the brain and to write the brain. In chimpanzee body, brain waves telemetered from the left and right amygdala were received and automatically analyzed by an online analog computer. This instrument was instructed to recognize a specific pattern of waves. The computer was also instructed to activate a stimulator. Each time the waves appeared, radio signals were sent to Patty's brain to stimulate a point known to have negative reinforcing properties. Electrical stimulation of one cerebral structure was contingent upon specific EEG patterns in another area of the brain. Here they're using the decoding of real-time EEG data analysis to extract decisions about whether to rotate a block in a Tetris-like game before it's dropped to fill in a line. I'm sure everybody knows how the game works. The sender's decisions are transmitted via the internet to the brain of a third subject, the receiver, who cannot see the game screen. The decisions are delivered to the receiver's brain via magnetic stimulation of the occipital cortex. The receiver integrates the information received and makes a decision using EEG interface about whether to turn the block or keep it in the same position. And in a second round, they have a chance to validate and say, was that meant what you meant to do here? Yes or no? And they can confirm and they used five different groups of these three people, and they had an overall accuracy in this study of 81.3%. They pretty much got it right. They did pretty well, and I'm sure they have the capability of improving over time. They also ran a variable where they interjected artificial noise into one of the sender signals, and they found that the receiver was able to even discern between which of the two senders was more reliable and which one they trusted more. And chillingly, these Cornell researchers conclude that their results raise the possibility of a future brain-to-brain -brain interface that enables cooperative problem solving by humans using a social network of connected brains. That's the social network of the future. And here's a report on it in Science Alert. And this just came out in the last couple days, so this is brand new. And so as the two senders are deciding what decisions to make in Tetris, as they watch the game screen, they're asked to look at one of two flashing LEDs at the side of their computer screen, one flashing at 15 hertz and the other at 17 hertz, which produces a transmagnetic cranial stimulation signal in the brain 
that's then translated into EEG brain waves, and then that is sent over the internet to the receiver. So they're already doing this. And so BrainNet is specifically designed to work over the internet. It works even across the web. So they do have to have some kind of prosthetic EEG cap they put on and some kind of machine that modifies the brain waves according to the decision. But once they have that, the <laughs> people can connect and communicate non-verbally just through their brains over the internet. In spite of space or time or even language barriers, people will theoretically be able to work together in a group communication using their minds alone. And that is the literal definition of a hive mind. We've heard about the coming of a hive mind. This is one giant step forward for mankind towards no longer being human and becoming something else. Definition one, the property of apparent sentience in a colony of social insects acting as a single organism, each insect performing a specific role for the good of the group. Second definition, a collective consciousness analogous to the behavior of social insects in which a group of people become aware of their commonality and think and act as a community sharing their knowledge, thoughts, and resources. And they use as an example the global hive mind that's emerged with Twitter and Facebook. Just a metaphor, right? And the second part of that definition, such a group mentally characterized by uncritical conformity and a loss of sense of individuality and personal accountability. Well, that's the danger, isn't it? But the scientists at Cornell are, of course, not the only people working on it. Melissa reported on this several months ago with the work of Regina Dugan and Facebook in their Building 8 Research Collective, where they're working on some very serious and far-reaching uh, futuristic technological things. They've been working for at least a couple years now on a device that they plan to use that would allow people to type out words using a brain-computer interface. And if it goes according to plan, they would strap something onto the head, some kind of prosthetic device, and it would use an optical technique to decode the speech based on optically reading neurons inside your brain non-invasively and then translating those into speech, into letters and words. And they are hoping to get to the point where it can reach 100 words a minute, which is much faster than they can do now. And they're going to use a variety of infrared light reading technology because the brain uh, works partially based on photons, or at least photons have been shown to modify the brain. And so the use of these light waves can quickly and accurately read brain waves. And they're hoping that even if they can't get to the point right away of typing 100 words a minute based on interpreting the part of your brain that sends speech <laughs> into your vocal organs, that they can at least master a yes or no, click or don't click function that they say would be basically a brain mouse. And so... Facebook is attempting to create a mind reading device so its users can think their Facebook posts directly into the platform without having to type anything. What if you could type directly from your brain. It sounds impossible, but it's closer than you may realize. We're talking about decoding those words, the ones you've already decided to share by sending them to the speech center of your brain. In a few years time, we expect to demonstrate a real-time silent speech system capable of delivering 100 words per minute. So Facebook and Regina Dugan, who's a very interesting character, if you're not familiar with her, I won't spoil it for you, you can look up. We've done a number of videos on her over the years. They're very much involved in some very serious technology. They are connected to DARPA and the military projects. It's very clandestine and covert on one side of it. And it's very much technology in Silicon Valley on the other side of it. And they're creating a path to a future that very few, if any of us, saw coming. And very few, if any of us, are going to be readily adapted to. Yes, they can use it for people who have disabilities, who can't talk, who can't communicate. Yes, they can use it to efficiently get work done and possibly make people's lives better. But at what cost? At what cost is this technology going to eat into, first of all, the freedom inside of our brain, the last remaining freedom 
that Orwell talked about in 1984. When they have everything else in society controlled, when it's regimented, when they watch you on telescreens, when the people you interact with spy on you, when everything you do is tracked and traced and cataloged, you know, you still at least have the freedom inside your brain. Or at least you did up until the point that Orwell wrote that in 1948 and the year that he projected in 1984. But today, your quote unquote cognitive liberty the freedom inside your brain is very much under threat. It's being eroded day by day in studies like this. And on the one hand, it's incredible what they could do with technology. On the other hand, <laughs> I mean, they're, they are now linking people's brains up to work in a collective, literally to work in a hive mind. And they're looking forward and saying this, this activity is the next generation of social networks. The new social network is one of connected brains, directly connected brains interacting over the internet. Here you can see uh, Sake, that's one of our other monkeys, uh, typing on a keyboard. But now it's, he's, it, this is telepathic typing. So to be clear, this is the, He's, he's not actually using a keyboard. He's moving a, a, the cursor with his mind uh, to the highlighted key. Now, now technically, um, uh, we can't, can't actually spell and... Uh, <laughs> so I don't want to oversell this thing. But what's really cool here is, is um, Sake the monkey is moving the mouse cursor using just his mind, moving the cursor around to the highlighted key and then spelling out what we, uh, you know, what we want, what we want to spell. But um, and then, uh, so so this this is uh, something that could be used for, for somebody who's who's say uh, uh, quadriplegic or tetraplegic uh, human. Um, even before we make the the, the spinal cord stuff work, uh, is being able to con uh, control a mouse cursor, control a phone. Um, and we, we're, we're confident that, you, that uh, someone who is, has basically no other interface to the outside world would be able to uh, control their phone better than someone who has working hands. I think it's also important to show that um, Sake actually likes doing the demo um, <laughs> and is not like strapped to the chair or anything. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, so. Um, the monkeys actually enjoy doing the demos because they and, and they get the banana smoothie and it's kind of a fun game. So, um, we, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make is like we care a great deal about animal wel <laughs> welfare, <laughs> and um, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure we, like our monkeys are pretty happy, you know. So, as you can see, a quick decision maker on the fruit front. So for our, the first two applications we're going to aim for in humans um, are restoring uh, vision. And uh, th th I think this is like notable in that even if someone has never had vision ever, like they were born blind, uh, we're, we believe they can, they, they can, we can still restore vision. We can stimulate neural activity in the brain by injecting current through every channel. This is important because it allows us to bypass the eye and generate a visual image in the brain directly. In this image, I've highlighted the calcarine sulcus in red in an MRI. It contains a map of the visual world, the visual field. It's about a surface area equal to a credit card on each side. One of the seminal discoveries was that every cell in the visual cortex represents only a tiny part of the visual field. Your perception is made up of a mosaic of tiny receptive fields, each belonging to a single cell in your visual cortex. So if you record from one of these cells in a monkey, say, in this location, you can find a very tiny region of the screen where a light stimulus will cause modulation of that neuron. This is a schematic of what a visual prosthesis using our N1 device, device might look like. A camera, the output from a camera, would be processed by an iPhone, for example, which would then stream the data to the device, and the image would be converted into a pattern of stimulation of the electrodes into visual cortex. With a 1,000 electrodes, we might be able to produce an image resembling something that you see there on the right. 
So our first steps along these dimensions for our device is what we call the N1 implant. It's a size of, of about a quarter, and it has over 1,000 channels that are capable of recording and stimulating. It's uh, microfabricated on a flexible thin film arrays that we call threads. It's fully implantable and wireless, so no wires, and after the surgery, uh, the, the implant is under the skin and it is invisible. 